So, Lord, we just pray that you would illuminate your word to us tonight and that you would take us a little deeper into the, to the story, your story that is our story. And uh, we thank you and give you all the thanks and praise. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, I want us to dig in a little bit this evening. Um, I love the whole the whole story leading up to Easter and the whole Lenten uh, time is it's so precious, such a precious thing that we can walk through that story together and know that story. I was talking with uh, some children this week. Um, and who don't go to church, and they had uh, done the whole Easter egg hunt thing. And they'd found their eggs, and they were showing me their um, uh, all of the goodies that they had in their Easter basket, and it was fun, and it was happy. And I, I said, well, do you know why? You, why did you get those? Why, why do we have Easter? And it was just silence. So I don't, I don't know. Well, I don't know. And, you know, this was just the innocence of a child, and it was not any, certainly nothing to be judgmental of. They just did not know. They said, why? And they kind of paused, like, they were going to say it was maybe like the Santa Claus thing, or, well, I don't know. And then finally, uh, he said, well, I think we've just been good, so we always get presents at this time. <laughs> but there was not any, not any even the remote, you know, there's not a connection. And I don't ever, you know, because of the, the setting uh, where I grew up, I, it made me realize, first of all, to, to be grateful that I've never not known this story. And it, it reminded me not to take it for granted. You know, I remember dying Easter eggs. Um, I remember having the little plastic eggs with the candy in them and trying to find the one with the dollar. But I, that never felt like the priority to me. That even, even as a child, I still saw the cross. I still saw the empty tomb. I still knew the story. And pe this culture, we're living in a post-Christian culture. In, in my lifetime, it's changed. And I love that, that m more people than usual on Easter Sunday are thinking about Jesus. Even if they don't know who he is, even if they don't know the story, more people than usual go to church. Even if they only go to, to a Christian church. Even if they only go because their mom really likes for them to come to church that one time a year and maybe Christmas too. Even, even if they're just there to support, that's it, they're, they're, they're getting here. There's something about it that still has meaning. And so I think that it's all the more important uh, for us to just soak in this story and, in, and love it to the last drop because it's our story. It's his history is not history for us. It's his story that we are part of, that we are participating in. And we have a great commission now. You know, there's not an, an Easter Sunday and then every other Sunday. Every Sunday is designed to be a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Every Sunday is a celebration of of the completion of that story. That's why we gather. And we mustn't let the story be lost. Even those children who are hunting for Easter eggs, I used to teach in a public school for a little bit. And I was instructed that I was not ever to sing Christian songs in the public school here in Nashville. I taught the grade school, kindergarten through fourth grade. And I was at Christmas time, I was not to ever sing songs that had the Christ story in it. And that was, so I, I you know, I had to be very cautious with that. But at, at Easter time, we're the only ones with this story. And I was in a, a, a conversation with, with, you know, it, 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 
at the at the Christmas story when I'd be singing with the children, we would also sing the dreidel, dreidel, dreidel song, and we'd sing some. That's not a Christmas song, but we'd sing some other songs of. There were songs of other faiths that they would bring in, even though Christmas is is Christ. But what I'm getting at is, I then had a conversation with someone else this week who did the whole Easter egg uh, hunt thing with uh, her children. And I said, well, what did you tell them Easter was for? And, and she said, I, well, I looked up the story. And don't all of the religions have, have a story like this? And, you know, we just kind of looked at it from all the different religions. I said, no, this story's not in the other religions. <laughs> it's not in the other ones. And she said, oh, you know, I guess I was just looking at different. She said, we looked at how Easter is celebrated around the world. So we were looking at how, you know, the Eastern Orthodox Christians celebrate Easter and the Western Orthodox Christians celebrate Easter and the, you know, in different areas, but all Christian because the other religions in this world don't have a resurrected Savior. This is an important thing for us to hold in our heart and know the resurrection power that Pastor Sean was talking about Sunday because there's something different about it. And there's love everywhere. There's, you can read in Ephesians uh, around chapter 4. I've been really honing in on this little passage and just kind of soaking with it and carrying it with it so everywhere I go because the, the prevailing message in the New Testament and that, that Jesus said, this is not just for the Gentiles. Of course, Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Jewish man. He was a Jew. And so he wasn't trying to start a new religion. He was trying to say, Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And, and then he showed the resurrection power of who we are created to be. And of course, then Christianity was born. But then as Paul carried on and all the Christianity was being born, and we get into the, the, the book of Acts that Pastor Sean was talking about Sunday, um, we, we begin to, to see the story unfold and what it's going to be in the Christian church is born. But Paul said again and again and again and again, this is for everybody. This is not just for this one select people. Jesus died on the world, on the cross, not to condemn the world, but to love it. It's for all. And so we have quite a commission. And I want us to look at, I want us to look at something because so I'm, I'm telling you what you already know, because we're, we're here to be encouraged and lifted up and inspired and washed in the water of God's word. But I, I went to a movie uh, uh, when it came out before COVID uh, called Frozen 2 with my two little grandsons, Patton and Jensen, and my daughter, Danielle, and her husband, Trace, and they're up in McLean, Virginia. So we went to this theater, and we were watching Frozen 2. And it got toward the end, and all the people in the theater got up and walked out. And my daughter sat there. She said, wait, Mom. We always like to wait and see if there's any last little bit because sometimes in the, especially in the Disney movies, the story will end and it will say the end and the end credits play and then there'll be some really neat thing that happens after that. So in Frozen 2, of course, the snowman comes back and says a little thing and we would have missed that, but I mean, we had to wait through a lot of end credits. We had to wait and wait and wait, my, my grands, but my grandsons, were they waited with us until we could get that last little juicing the story out and that last little tidbit. And so I want us to, we, we've already had Easter punctuates our story with the end. Now the end credits have been rolling, and we've got all of the characters in place, and, and uh, the stone has been rolled away, and we've got the whole cast and crew, and it is finished. And then if you wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, then you see that last bit at the end. And so I want us to look at the end, uh, th th then what happened? Because the end is never the end for us in Christ, is it? We learned about the resurrection power of Jesus. The end is never the end. No matter what happens, the end is always a new beginning in Christ, isn't it? And so look in chap uh, at, at Mark's gospel. We're going to look at each of the endings for just a few minutes. And then I want to tell you a quick little story. 
And I, I, I think that many of you may, if, if you're like me, I love to read the four Gospels during Easter. I just like to get all four of them read through East, e Lent and Easter and just read the story again. And then I like to do that again at Advent so I can just keep my heart fresh with the story. Uh, but now that it's, it's, it's past, it's really fun this week for your devotional reading to go into and just read what happened then. So let's look at um, chapter 16 of Mark's gospel. And, you know, they, they go, the stone is rolled away, and the tomb is empty. And then look over at verse uh, 8. Let me make sure I'm telling you the right verse. Well, it's right after verse 8. If you, if you have a Bible that, um, I'm, I'm reading the NRSV, which uh, is the one I love because they say that it's the most current, um, it's, it's the most uh, accurate transliteration that you can get of, of all the biblical translations. But if you'll notice, there's a Mark 16, verse 8, and then there's a Mark 16, verse 9, and there's a verse without a number in there. And that's not in all Bibles, but it's in the more current ones since they have um, completed some of the, you know, they found the, uh, they, they've learned the archaeologists and, and folks found things. So this is the first, Mark used to have a different ending than it has now. And this used to be the end of the Gospel of Mark. And here was the ending after the end credits. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. And that used to be the end of that. And then later, someone thought, well, that's just not the best ending, and we're going to add a little bit to that. So, of course, Mark's gospel would have been written 30 to 60 years after the see Jesus Mark's gospel was probably the first of the of the four gospels written. And Mark's gospel, we know, scholars say, was probably written by a young man. And one reason we know that is the language of this gospel. because And immediately, and then they hurried, and they went, and they did. So it's like, it's like one of my, college, my young college kids talking, we got to get on with this. So it's written in this really brief language. And we know that Matthew and Luke... Scholars know that Matthew and Luke had probably read Mark's gospel and had access to it. They say that those other two gospels, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. And those Matthew and Luke had access to Mark's gospel and another source that they call the Q source. But that's just an interesting thing. So Mark was probably written by a young guy, and he's telling the story, and then, and then, and then, and then. And uh, the guy who wrote Mark is pro might even be the guy who, was, um, who ran away, who, uh, who was with Peter, Peter's assistant. There's some speculation of that um, when Peter cut off the soldier's ear. So then if you start at verse 9, now, after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. And she went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest. But they did not believe them. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and their stubbornness, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes is and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned." And these signs will accompany those who believe by using, the, by using my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. 
They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that accompanied it. And if you hear that um, up there in verse 16, and the one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be um, condemned. Uh, who, the, the writer of Mark, the writers of all of the New Testament, uh, including Jesus, of course, who quoted the, the Old Testament all the time, that verse might remind you of the verse in Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2.4, I believe it is, that says, now the righteous shall live by faith. Because righteousness, we say it a lot, is being rightly related to God. And so uh, we're condemned by, not by Jesus pointing a finger and saying, go to H-E double toothpicks, but condemned by the unbelief because the righteous live by faith. Because when we don't live by that faith, we're looking away from our very source. We're, we're unplugging from the source of our power and the source of life. And so that condemnation uh, is, is more of a separation concept. And um, I've heard Pastor Sean teaching about that a lot here lately. So Mark says, okay, Jesus has, has um, uh, that, that's, that's how Mark writes the end of that story. And they, and they did catch on and they got faith and they went out and they uh, proclaimed the good news everywhere. So he's like, then the women saw him, then the men saw him, and now we can do all this stuff, and this is great, and then Jesus ascends, and it's done. Okay, now turn to Luke's gospel. And you also heard smatterings of, I mean, Matthew's gospel. You also heard smatterings of uh, the, the uh, Apostles' Creed in there. Jesus ascended and was seated at the right hand of God. So that's in our Apostles' Creed. And that's where we get that. So now go to the end of Matthew, which has 28 chapters. It's a little longer. And this is a completely different personality writing this. God uses our personalities and our different gifts and our different... He equips us for what he's called us to do, partly with the personality and the skill sets that he gives us, doesn't he? You don't always ask for the gifts you're given. I didn't ask for the gift of music. I, I never... That, it's another thing that I n didn't... And I never didn't know it. I always felt like it chose me. And, and so the, let's look at this personality uh, here as we, um, the end credits have scrolled. And then what happened? Well, uh, chapter 28, verse 1, there was a guard at the tomb and uh, there was an earthquake and the stone rolls away. And, um, and now look at verse 11. So we've had Easter Sunday, and while they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest everything that had happened. And after the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to soldiers, to the soldiers, telling them, you must say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, he will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story is still t told among the Jews to this day. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed him, them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And, of course, in, the Christian, in our Christian faith, for all Christians, that's one of the non-negotiables of our faith that we have a great commission to go and say what we have seen and testified. N.T. Wright wrote a book, a wonderful book on the, on, the, on the resurrection, and he said, you know, 
if there had not been these witnesses at the tomb who told them and told them and told them, and then 30 years later, somebody wrote it down, and then 60 years later, it was probably 60 years before the Gospel of John was written down, um, according to our best uh, uh, scholarship on that, um, we wouldn't have the story because it's all the witnesses. It's just witnesses. That's how important the word of your testimony is. It's not a, a matter of preference, a matter of, oh, well, this is what I believe. It's a matter of eyewitnesses. And they really wanted to make sure that we got that. And Jesus is declaring that authority. So in Mark's gospel, we have this young guy going, you guys, he's raised from the dead. Look at this. And Jesus had said, and we'll see in a few minutes, greater works than these shall you do. And Jesus is saying, whoever wrote Mark said, has Jesus saying, we'll be able to pick up snakes and they won't bite us. And we'll be able to, if somebody tries to poison us for declaring the gospel, it won't affect us. God's going to protect us. But Mark tells it almost like a grand adventure, doesn't he? Like he's Indiana Jones or something, right? And he's naming the specific little details. Because that's his, his personality. That's his, his perspective. That's, that's how he saw it. That's how he's heard it. That's, that's what his experience of it was. And, and then Matthew goes uh, up into more of a bird's eye view. You know, Mark is real hands-on, real hands-on. But Matthew, he was a tax collector. So he's used to thinking of crowds. He's used to thinking corporately. He's a businessman. And so he says, you know, we need to go on to all the world and carry this gospel. So Matthew tells the story that way. And, of course, Matthew, we know, the writer of Matthew was probably highly educated because of the Greek uh, way that this, he was probably a well-educated Pharisee and the way that he, he wrote his text. And so he takes that more global view of, no, we got we to gotta market this thing. We got to get out and reach all the people. And he had that way of thinking like a CEO, you know, and uh, whereas Mark is thinking like a soldier on the ground. And uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful um, seeing these perspectives. Now look over to Luke's gospel. And Luke has, is it 24 little chapters? And... Uh, So Luke has a very uh, famous, you know, and now you noticed in Mark's gospel, he said when he went and he told Mary Magdalene and told, told the women and, and uh, that he was risen, he appeared to them and they doubted. And he appears to two of the men walking along the road. Well, Luke has the actual road. <laughs> he gives us some more of the story. Uh, so I love this one so much. Uh, they, they're walking along the road to Emmaus. And let's, let's just um, let's back up and start reading a little of, of this. I love, I, I, I love sometimes uh, with a Bible study that I teach on Tuesday, I love reading great big chunks of Scripture because so often we, we either pick up a little, sound, uh, a little sound bite of Scripture in the morning with our morning devotion with the verse of the day, it's really easy to get in a hurry and get in that pattern. Uh, or we uh, hear more sermons about the Scripture than we actually hear the Scripture itself, which is, which is great. I mean, we need, we need that. But I, I love it when the Holy Spirit reminds me, don't forget to read the whole story <laughs> where all the sermons are coming from. Um, but it's, uh, and, and the Gospels are definitely the place to do that, because the, the, and this story especially, because it's not hard to understand. It doesn't really need a lot of explanation. It's like watching a movie. So verse 13, now on the same day, two of them, probably the same two Mark was referencing, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. Can you imagine that? And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with him. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you're walking along? And they stood still, looking sad. 
And then one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you only a stranger? Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? And so it makes you think Jesus was a tease. And he asked them, what what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. So he goes on and tells the story. And when you see up there in verse uh, 15 that I read, no, 16, uh, 15, uh, 16, uh, okay. Yeah, verse 16. Uh, their eyes were kept from seeing him. Doesn't that just make you think of John's Gospel, chapter 9? Do you remember what story is in John's Gospel, chapter 9? Because all the dots connect, right? And And it's all... His story. And we're getting to see it through all these different lenses and experiences. Just like we are all seeing Jesus through our different experiences and lenses as God shows us. But in John chapter 9, he heals the blind man. And everyone gets mad at him for healing the blind man. And Jesus, uh, the blind man comes and thanks Jesus and says, are you the one who healed me? And, and he said, yes. And he said, well, thank you. And I pray that we'll remember to keep thanking Jesus as we go into resuming life as normal after this. We've been through with COVID. We've been through with things. We've just had Easter. But let's keep remembering and keep remembering every Sunday to come back and thank him for giving us our sight, for letting us tell his story through our story. And in John 9, uh, the people get angry that he got healed. And Jesus, I can't imagine what he was thinking. Like, seriously, you're angry with me for healing this blind man? And, of course, they didn't like him to do God's business on the Sabbath. How odd is that? But Jesus says, I did not come. uh, He said, I came to make the blind see and those who can see blind. Isn't that one of the most curious things? Verses in the Bible, I came to make those who, can, who are blind see and those who can see blind. And he was talking to the religious people, and I can't help but think to the religious law people, because I'm a religious person, but I'm not a legalistic person or a judgmental person. So I, when I say I'm a religious person, I mean my religion is to love God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my strength. Religion's got, the, the word religion's gotten a, a really bad rap, if you ask me, because it's beautiful. I love being a religious person. It just means I have a language to say, I love you, Lord, with a lot of people who are speaking that same love language. It's a love language. My religion is a love language. But anyway, the, when, the, when the people got religiously judgmental and legalistic, Jesus said, I've come to make them blind. God just loves to throw wrenches in the work and make us scratch our head and question, well, okay, just when I thought I had this all figured out. And he's walking along the road to Emmaus with him, and he just disappears just like that, right? Their their eyes are kept from seeing him, and he's with them one minute, and he's gone the next. And isn't that just how God is and keeps that curiosity and that carrot dangling in front of us all the time? Because our faith is so much about longing. Didn't Jesus speak about longing all the time? Seek, and you shall find. But to seek, you've got to be curious. You've got to be longing. You've got to be looking. You've got to be wanting to have our desire. The word paradise. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And what is paradise? If you take the word paradise and study that word from the Greek, and it'll link back to that word in Hebrew, Eden. And the word Eden, uh, even though we think of the Garden of Eden, the word Eden's actual root meaning means delight and desire. Because that's a place to desire to be with God where God desired to be with them. So Jesus restored that paradise of a heart that desires and delights in God himself. I could just sit and think about that for a little bit of a while. 
And so they're on the road to Emmaus. They're walking. They don't recognize Jesus. And then he uh, reveals himself to him, and he has a he has a good laugh because he's a tease. So the writer of Luke is telling a story and getting all the details right because Luke was a doctor. And what do doctors do? And nurses, they have to keep impeccable records or something can go terribly wrong. Just keeping the record, the record keep and, and documenting and telling it, telling the, the truth of how it is. And so Luke is telling us a great story here and, and keeping all those um, an accounting. He even starts out the book of Luke. You know, well, young Theophilus, I'm, I'm, here to, I'm here to set the account straight. He's keeping the account straight. And so uh, then look at verse 36. While they were talking about this, Jesus stood among them because they were trying to figure out where he went uh, and said to them, peace be with you. And they, uh, they were startled and terrified, and thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened, and, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Isn't that maybe what a doctor would say? <laughs> you know, a doctor who's been examining people, but he saw Jesus raised from the dead, and he must have been the one thinking, Okay, this is actually not possible. <laughs> you know, he would have been a really pragmatic one. And if, so he said, Well, look. You can see. And... uh so I think that's an interesting uh, perspective. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said to the, this to them, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while uh, in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondered, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. So Jesus is physically with them, uh, and, uh, and it, this one is just kind of focused on that physical body aspect. And, and, uh, and then he said to them, uh, these are my uh, words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their mouths, I mean their minds, to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer, to rise from the dead, and on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending out, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And so Luke keeps the, keeps the account straight. You know, well, the records show that, that Moses said this was going to happen and the law had to be fulfilled, and this leads to that, leads to this leads to that. Uh, and so it's very logical. It's very physical presentation, uh, like you, you might expect a physician to notice that part. Um, and then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. There's that go back to church and keep giving thanks thing. And so that's yet another perspective on the story. And again, uh, if you imagine, Jesus has, has spent the three years in ministry with them. He's, uh, he's been crucified, dead, and buried. The resurrection has happened. And then he's, he's uh, walked with them. And then the story is going to go on. And 30 years goes by. Think of your life 30 years ago. And somebody, the story's been circulating around town. They keep telling it and telling it. Do you remember? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? That's why it's so important we keep telling the story. So if we talk about the Easter egg, maybe get to it where, you know, God made the chicken. <laughs> or the Because the pagan ritual of Easter eggs is based on the, the um, that's why it's called Easter. Easter is not a Christian religious word. It's a pagan word. Uh, and that's the God that is about the God of fertility, and that's why it's the egg. 
Uh, and that's moved away from the Christian theme that we know. But without the witnesses, what story goes on? What's the story behind it? Why do all the kids get Good Friday off? They don't know what's good about it. And that's getting lost in our culture. It's already lost to a large extent in our culture. So every time we gather in his name, every time we're here on a Wednesday night, even if it's two or three of us gathering in his name, we are being eyewitnesses to the story. Every time we get up on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, and go in his name, every time we speak his name and speak his truth and live his truth, we are being those witnesses. Otherwise, how will they know? That's how important it is. Because the story you tell is the one that carries on. And so somebody had repeated this story for 30 years. And for John's gospel, let's turn to that now as we close, as we wind down. John's gospel has 21 chapters. It's my personal favorite. If, if, um, uh, and John's gospel is, is, was written uh, the, the best uh, research and information I've ever read on, God, on John's gospel. I, I love studying the Johannine writings um, and where the story went from there. So John's gospel was probably written late in the whole story. Um, so maybe even as late as 90. Uh, so maybe 60 years, 50 or 60 years after, uh, after this story happened. Some say that John's gospel was even written by a community of people. John's gospel is very um, uh, poetic. It's very spiritual. So... I like to think this is this is the way I would have wanted to tell the story. You know, Mark's telling it. I wouldn't want to talk about the snakes. I was like, we don't need to remember that part. <laughs> I wouldn't want, you know, or that that impest, Im, Im, impetuous. Let's get down there in the trenches and 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 you know, really conquer evil. Uh, and I really wouldn't have been like Matthew because I get really bogged down in Excel sheets and and all of that kind of uh, database kind of stuff. It's like. Okay, and that, that CEO thing is good. I, I, I believe in the Great Commission, but that, that whole, uh, uh, you know, okay, now everything's got to be just so, and I love liturgy, you know me. I'm, I'm a big liturgical person. And then Luke, I would, have, I, I, would have, I would have appreciated Luke's story, but when I get to John, it's like, and the wind blows where it will. <laughs> and it's just such a beautiful, uh, poetic, it's very poetic. Uh, but let's look at John uh, 21, uh, starting with verse 15. Now, I'll tell you what had happened. Um, he comes back. He's resurrected. Well, look back at 19. Um, when it was evening on that day, uh, the doors of the house where the disciples had met uh, were locked for fear of the Jews, and Jesus came and stood among them. So he appears to them, too, in the flesh. He says those same words, peace be with you. So everyone is remembering that story the same way. All, uh, and he said, he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So, uh, he did the, uh, showing that, uh, and then, uh, his disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord and Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Uh, so he wanted them to have peace over what had happened, didn't he? As the father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So, a uh, very artful thing to do. <laughs> he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And which we're going to see, Luke wrote Acts, and we're going to see the holy tongues of fire uh, coming down with uh, uh, the flames on them in the upper room um, uh, a book uh, later. If you forgive... The sins of in, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So he's leaving them with this message of forgiveness um, because all is forgiven. All is forgiven. And so then we get doubting Thomas, uh, Jesus and Thomas' story, and, um, and the physicality of that as well. And then the purpose of this book, 
verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But those, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah means messenger. He's the messenger of God, the son of God, that through believing you may have life in his name. So it's a very, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth through us as it is in heaven. We're commissioned to be a testimony of that, to exemplify that, and to let him breathe on us every, every day brand new. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's new every morning. He breathes creative life into us, creative ideas into us for, for whether you're the, whether you're the, uh, the corporate thinker or the, the uh, in the trenches thinker or the doctor thinker or the poet. He breathes new life in you every day to 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 be his witness, and he's the one who empowers us to fulfill that great commission because it's really him fulfilling it through us. We just tell the story. And he clears all of that clutter out of our minds from the pain of the past, from the pain of the things that we've suffered, from the things that make us afraid or depressed or anxious, and, and all of those things that can distract us so that our lips, in Isaiah chapter 6, he says, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and the angel came, and he touched a hot coal to my lips, and I said, woe is me, I am, uh, I am only a human being, and yet my eyes have seen, and our eyes have seen, and we testify. And Jesus promised in John 17, just a couple of chapters later, that he, uh, he prayed for us, for those to come who will believe in me, to, we're to be empowered with a Holy Spirit-filled resurrection life. And then in 21 is when, uh, when the... the uh, Peter, who had denied him three times. Do you know him? No. Do you know Jesus? No. Do you know Jesus? No. And then Jesus had to watch, Peter had to watch Jesus die. And oh, how his heart must have broken. Oh, how his heart must have broken. When I, I could have helped my friend. But what does the scripture say? A broken and contrite heart I will not despise. So Peter was forgiven and all the more ambitious. And so Jesus, being the gracious and loving Savior that he is, talks to Peter and says, Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I tell that story. I've told that story so many times during this in so many different settings because I love it so much. He denies, 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 but he gets a second chance and a second chance and a second chance because that's the grace of God that we have. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. And so then in verse, um, look at verse uh, 24. Uh, this is the disciple who is testifying to you these things and has written them. This is through the voice of John, who then went on later to write 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the book of Revelation. And we know <coughs> that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did. And I love this so much. And if every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Is that not the best? This is, it's just, I just love that. It's such creative writing for starters because that's a metaphor. You know, if a book could be written, <laughs> they could say, all the things that Jesus did. And he's only referring to a little three minute, three years of a ministry time. The whole world can contain. This person was blown away by what they saw. And I pray that we will come to church this Sunday and every Sunday and wake up with God's steadfast new love every morning and think, if, if a book could be written to contain everything that God has done for me, and is going to do for me and my family and, and my church, I, the world couldn't contain it. I pray that we will carry that heart around. And I want to encourage you as a, as a benedictory verse. 
uh, I'll, I'll just reference it, but if you get the chance to go back and read John uh, chapter 3, uh, John 3.16 is our big famous Christian verse, for God so loved the world. Uh, but right before then, Nicodemus comes talking to him and says, how am I to be born again? Well, how are you born again? You know, Jesus, you wake up with, with, with Jesus every morning and he breathes on you. <laughs> Just like in John. And, and uh, Jesus says, and, and don't, don't forget, God's going to surprise you with joy. It's joy sometimes the evidence of God's presence. God's going to surprise you today. Just watch what he can do because in John chapter 3, he says, Jesus says, the wind blows where it will. And you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. You just get up every day and say, yes, Lord. And, uh, and say, God, I, I want as much of you as, as I can contain. I want that river flowing through me. Um, I'll leave you with this, this tiny little analogy as we, as we uh, pray. We're going to pray and say goodbye. Uh, I told this story in my group. And for two weeks in a row, I love it so much. But there, there was a little man in India. A story goes that a, a little man in India had a magic had magic dye for dyeing fabric, and he uh, he would go into the middle of the town, and all of the people who who made the fabric. You know, there's a lot of this kind of story, and this is not a Bible story, but it's a really neat uh, God story. Uh, dyeing the fabric. You know, there's a lady in the Bible who dyes the fabric purple, and and of course, Rahab had the had the fabric that was dyed red that she hung the, the and the red cord outside of her window. Well, this this little man with a ma- a tub of magic dye would go down to the to the city and he'd wait in the street. And people would bring their fabric and they would line up, and the first person would come up and say, "I I would like for my fabric to be yellow, please." And the man would the spirit he was a the spiritual man in the town. And he would dip the fabric, the cloth, into the, uh, into the dye, and it would come out yellow, just the exact color the person asked for. And then the next one in line said, well, I would like for mine to be blue as the sky. And so the man would dip the fabric in the same exact fluid and dip it in, right? Everybody saw it happen. And well, this is a little parable. And he would dip the fabric in, he'd pull it back out, and it would be just the same color blue that the person had wanted, that they desired, that they would delight in. And so then he, he, the next one, I would like for my fabric to be green. So he dips it in the same, doesn't change a thing, doesn't do anything to it, comes out green. All the people are amazed. And then another person comes along who is very wise and brings their fabric and says, I would like for my fabric to be the color of that dye. And what the... Uh, parable is, I know it's cool, isn't it, that that hits you, and what the parable is, that represents the living water, that represents love the gift, the giver more than the gift, you, you seek and you will find, seek God, not the gifts he'll give you, seek him, seek ye first the kingdom of God, say, God, I want the color of your water, whatever you desire it to be, and, and I think that these four gospels, Speak to that of what they were seeking, and they all have a seeking of God. Uh, and tell that story of, and, and, and seek that uh, kingdom. But So there you go. Um, I hope that you have a beautiful, blessed week. Let's close in prayer. Uh, Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for the testimony of your word, and thank you for that we are your living word. We are living epistles, your living word, known and read of all the people who, who see us and meet us and talk to us. So, Lord, uh, keep us pure. Keep us aligned with you. Keep us rightly related to you. And thank you for that gift of grace. Keep us hungry for you, for more of you, for your, uh, the depths and the riches that are you, so that we delight and have our desire set on you, and then all of these things that we need will be added to us. Um, And so, Lord, we trust that. We pray that you would um, give uh, Pastor Sean and his family traveling mercies, bring them home safely, and, and, uh, and, and bless them, and be with everyone here tonight uh, in the week and those who are watching. And just, Lord, our arms and our hearts and our minds are wide open 
to have all that you have for us. So, Lord, we receive and we say amen to your commission to us to go into all the world and proclaim this good news. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.